Yes, yeah, so uh, Gary Ann is here. Uh, so I'm gonna see if you can see her. Good to see you again. It should move. Oh, how are you? Good, how are you? I don't know, I don't think it's moving. <laughs> Maybe Wait. my voice is too high. It was earlier though. It was there. Say something again. Hello. Hello. Oh, there we, go. there we go. Good to see you again. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Yeah, good, excellent, excellent. Okay. Awesome. So we'll get started in just a few minutes. We'll give uh, a couple more people to join the uh, the chat, or well, not the chat, but join either virtually or in person. If you got like yeah, eight, eight more minutes. Yeah. yeah. I hope the link is fixed because that was very janky. I I think it's because it started at seven. Yeah, and it said six, so I think that had to do with it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I was like, literally, literally, I just had your voice going like, "That's not very acceptable." Playing in my head over and over again. <laughs> when I noticed, like, "Oh, the link's not working." Wait, you had my voice in your head? Yeah, like that's not very accessible. <laughs> oh gosh, I did. I guess I. I didn't know I said that that often. <laughs> Whoops, not that often. <laughs> it's just like a thing. It's just a thing. Well, I hope it's a good thing. I guess. It's sure, a good thing. <laughs> Oh, Dean, you're a genius. You want to answer any of these questions for Instagram? Some of them we've already done people, so like, like don't do two people solo on resume. <laughs> right. <laughs> People ask dumb questions and they get given an opportunity to ask anything. Well, it's yeah. not a dumb question. Mm -hmm. They could have like, Googled. Not a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> but not a lot of people know it, though. Recording it. I don't think we're going to happen necessarily. Uh, it, it bothers me. Before, before I, I forget. Our MC got the number of federally recognized tribes of our now 574. Yeah. Is that more or less than this year? More. Yeah, yeah the, it's like the, the newest one has a really long name. It's like Little Band, Chippewa, something, something. It's very long. I can never remember it. Now, now I actually want to answer <laughs> this. It was one of our trivia questions, but I think I had to write it down because I was yeah. like halfway through it. <laughs> <answer that. laughs> so, what question do you want me to try to answer? Um, do you want to do why does Indigenous Peoples Day matter? Or you could do what if there was one thing you wish people better understood about indigeneity, what would it be? Or let's see, what else do you got? You mean the little show fight of Chippewa Indians? Is that what it is? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I just yeah, yeah, I keep getting them confused. Um <coughs> oh, oh well, that one's wrong. Um well, what, almost like I'm going to do land and What do you think the land and is? that one? I'm going to push you towards why IPD important, but you can do whatever you want. Because it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, say the name of your tribe for me again, because it's uh, not both. It's it's just the one. It's no score. Okay, because it's because usually people say second box, but you're just yeah, one like, of them. Yeah, well, well, like, yeah. So like, we're part of like the Second Box Nation, and um, the Squawky is like our like official, we're yeah. like our like tribal thing. Yeah, because you guys are from Great Lakes. Oh uh, yeah, Great Lakes. Lake. Yeah. Yeah. Which like we've been in. Well, actually, no, we're from like that area, at least like within like the past like years. Yeah. Because. Because you weren't part of the. Um, the Ho Chunk. You guys weren't part of the Ho Chunk. The Ho Chunk, I think you guys were from the Ho Chunk. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, if you go back out towards the front, you're fine. Oh, okay. I just know about like what happened like last summer. Yeah. I just know one of your guys' tribes is right next to ours now. 
because they fought over what to name the creek. <laughs> oh, not the same. Yeah. Hey, my tribe won. <laughs> um, I don't know why they didn't use our original name, but you know, our I just found out these terms endonym instead of exonym. Is the, isn't like endonym like internal, like what they call themselves? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So they didn't use ours, they used what other people called us. Like if you're gonna rename it because you know think the other creek was culturally appropriate, like then why would you <laughs> yeah, it's like, why would we not go all the way? Oh, yeah, use people's endonyms, not their exonyms. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mind. It's just it's just funny that like, because yeah. the previous name they thought was culturally insensitive, so they changed it. But when they changed it, they used the name that was given to us and not the name we called ourselves. Uh, do you think they my, did that because the Canadians were like, no, don't say that? Yeah, no, 100% because my tribe was like, this is not offensive. Yeah. Until someone ruined that for me. Because, <laughs> like, in our language, that's not offensive. But I think it's rubbing off on us. Um, because in your area, like, Canada is um, where that tribe comes from that has that word is offensive. But, like, in our area, it's not. What is that? <laughs> because I think I know what it is. And I'm like, oh no, that, that for us, it just means woman. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> 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 that that nice place back to twenty fifteen. Have you had a good Indigenous Peoples Day so far, Dr. Seymour? I'm sorry? Have you had a good Indigenous Peoples Day so far? I'm having trouble hearing you. No. Have you had a good Indigenous Peoples Day? Uh, you're still not clear, I'm sorry. I think um, my doesn't make sense. I can hear feedback. It's so new. It's, um, Maybe the captions aren't on. There we go. Try it again. Try again. Okay. Did you have a good Indigenous Peoples Day? Uh, I am so far. Yes, I am. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry I missed your powwow earlier today. I enjoyed it last year, but I had a commitment today uh, uh, that conflicted, so I wasn't able to do that. Well, um, did you know, so I, we were looking. I was in the area and they said there was one that the BIAC had, but that it was most likely canceled. Do you know of any ones by chance? Because I know you're very involved in the community powers. Yeah, the uh, BAIC, because of COVID, uh, canceled uh, again. Um, that's after 47 consecutive years of power. Wow. But uh, I think uh, I think that's pretty well the end of local powwow. Anyway, the Howard County powwow has already been held, so yeah. I can't end anything. Yeah, that's that's all I could find online too. I don't know if you had maybe secret connections where you knew some or something, <laughs> but hopefully we'll um, BAIC will open again soon. Well, it's uh. You know, it's 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 not only a, a wonderful cultural time for us, but it's also a significant fundraiser. And uh, mm -hmm. and for now, for the second year that it's canceled, it does really put a put a bind on the organization. But I think it was a smart thing to do, um, without having people just push together under the worst circumstances and uh, you know cause somebody uh, illness that wouldn't be necessary. So. Right, right. Awesome. Hello, Dr. Dennis Seymour. Welcome. Welcome everyone here and those who are tuning in with us virtually. 
Uh, thank you all. Uh, it has been a wonderful Indigenous Peoples Day celebration. Today we started out with our powwow, and this evening we are going to engage with our evening lecture with Dr. Dennis Seymour. Uh, we have been uh, just blessed by your connection and your presentations that you've delivered in the past uh, for this uh, special holiday and observation. And I want to give a big shout out to Indigenous students at Hopkins for really taking lead in ensuring that that the indigenous culture is uh, reversed and observed and celebrated, acknowledged and explored. And so thank you to Gary and Jasmine, uh, Connor, I think, remember your name? Jeremy. Jeremy <laughs> and uh, what's your name? <laughs> Hayden, I don't know, get the name and names uh, because they were really crucial to today's success. And I really wanna thank you all for really being there to volunteer and to make you know these things happen. And so I'm going to pass it to yeah. Yes, Gary's going to do the <laughs> No, no, I was trying to make sure that you were doing the right because I know you always talk about the program. Yeah. And so, yes, so Gary is going to kind of continue to take us throughout today's evening. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you. So it is an absolute pleasure to have you back, Dr. Seymour. I always thoroughly enjoy your lectures. They're very informative and thought provoking. So it is um, absolutely wonderful to have you back to hear from you tonight on Indigenous Peoples Day. And we're going to have Jasmine, our vice president, um, introduce you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, born Dennis Edwin Banks in Flint, Mich Michigan. His father is full Eastern Band Cherokee from Madison County, North Carolina. His mother is German and English from Ohio with a reported Iroquois ancestor several generations back. Dennis was adopted when he was five, but has always identified his race and heritage as Native American. He has been an activist for indigenous causes throughout his life. Dr. Seymour moved to Maryland in 1960 with his mother and graduated from high school in Howard County. He received an associate's degree from Cadenceville Community College, his proudest moment, um, two bachelor's degrees from the University of Maryland and a master's from the Johns Hopkins University and a doctorate from Southwest University. He was employed as a Maryland state trooper for 16 years and owned a private investigative firm for 20 years after that. He has been a professor for the Community College of Baltimore County, a department chair, and recently retired as the dean of the CCBC Kids School of Business, Education, Justice, and Law. He is a faculty advisor to the Indigenous Cultures Club and serves on the Native American Studies Program Advisory Board. Dr. Seymour has been a member of the Baltimore American Indian Center for over 25 years and chaired five Baltimore powwows that were held at CCBC Cadenceville. He recently served on the board, on the board directors of the Baltimore, Indian, Baltimore American Indian Center, um, serves on the Maryland Commission on Indian Affairs Advisory Board, the Maryland Commission on Indian Affairs Education Committee, and is the chair of the Baltimore American Indian Center Heritage Museum. And so now we have Dr. Seymour. So thank you so much. Uh, that just tired me out uh, hearing all of that. Uh, I am I'm very, I'm very proud to uh, be able to speak to uh, as an alumnus uh, of uh, Hopkins. I'm very happy to be able to speak with you uh, this evening. And if you've heard my lectures in the past, uh, uh, this one is a little different. This is a little less uh, doom and gloom. Uh, there's plenty of that to go around. So this one is a little, a little lighter uh, than than most in the past. But uh, I'm I'm hoping that you will uh, enjoy it. And uh, it's basically to dispel some common myths about Native Americans. Uh, and with that, I'll see if I can get my PowerPoint up. Uh, as a professor, I was told one time that PowerPoints are both powerless and pointless, but uh, I'm hoping that this will supplement what I have to say a little bit. All right, let me do share screen. There we go. Are we good with that on your side? Yes. 
Excellent. So everything that you wanted to know about American Indians, but we're afraid to ask. So if there are other questions, you need to ask them. So in the Salaji language of the Cherokee people, Osio, that's hello and welcome. So you can give me Osio back. Osio. Osio. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Osio Nagata is hello to everyone. Uh, so some common myths about, uh, about Indians. Uh, the first one, Indians are offended by being called Indian. And as you're aware, uh, the Baltimore American Indian Center is still the Indian Center. Uh, and most Native Americans are not offended by Indian. It was a mistake that Columbus made in his voyages in the late 1400s. He thought he'd found West Indi the West Indies and the people here, uh, the, the Arawak Indians uh, that he found were in fact thought to be a uh, West Indian people. So the myth or a fact, uh, it's, it's really a myth. We're, we're not offended. Um, I think the proper American, uh, the proper re re response would be that uh, Native American uh, is politically correct. And I think that indigenous is probably even more correct. And it recognizes the fact that uh, we were here uh, first. Uh, in the Indian community, there's kind of a joke that goes around uh, as people become politically correct about the term Indian, is we say that they gave us the name Indian and now they want to take that back. So we appreciate the sensitivity. Uh, I, I think indigenous Native American is all fine. I think another important thing uh, that's a myth, uh, all Indians look alike. What do you think, myth or fact? It's certainly a myth. Uh, if, if you get nothing else out of the lecture tonight, um, you need to understand that the makeup of the, the North American, of Native Americans and the North American continent were very similar to countries in Europe. The differences between nations, tribes, clans are as different as uh, uh, those Spanish, Italian, Swedish, Norwegians, and so forth. They're radically that different in their appearances, in their culture, and their beliefs. Now, there are several things that are kind of pan-Indian. Uh, for example, I wear a ribbon shirt. And that's pretty typical of most tribes. Um, as soon as the natives got access to linen materials and were able to sew them, not only would they sew shirts, but typical of Indian fashion, they would decorate the big Jesus out of them. So all the ribbons uh, on the shirts are, uh, are typical of that. So Characteristics of Native Americans do include high cheekbones, prominent brow ridge, straight black hair, not large nose, maybe so, maybe not. The Eastern uh, <coughs> tribes very often uh, are, are much fairer, uh, not a prominent uh, with the cheekbones, uh, somewhat in the brow ridge. Uh, they, they do possess mongoloid skeletal uh, characteristics, but all, all don't look alike. Uh, so of the 562 federally recognized tribes in the United States, they're very different in their appearance and customs. In this Fraser uh, engraving on the Buffalo nickel, this was a typical Plains Indian and was a result, according to Fraser, of three or four different Indians that he'd encounter. But this is what most people think when they think Native American, very prominent nose, heavy brow ridge um, and depicted uh, th for the first time there's really a good story with this Be besides the fact that this is the former football team is now the Washington football team um, and we were able to get rid of the name after decades of trying uh, unfortunately it was because of pressure from my understanding from FedEx 
uh, for the team to lose the, uh, the mascot. And uh, believe it or not, it's, it's gone. And I I'm, I'm hardly can believe it. Uh, followed, here, here was the, always the result of the explanation about the Washington football team. Long, proud history that deserves to be respected. Um, there's no, there's no race that should end up being the mascot of any sports team under any circumstance. And you've seen this one before. Here's another good story. The Chicago, I'm sorry, the Cleveland football team. This was Chief Wahoo. Very offensive. If you can imagine having taken that same logo and depicted it as uh, in, in the nursery rhyme of Little Black Sambo or of, or of some other ethnic group, how offensive that would be. Cleveland gave up, uh, a year ago, gave up the logo and have since given up the name um, in process of giving up the name, they'll be the Cleveland <coughs> Guardians. So we'll not see any of that. Um, Here's a great story. If any of you remember this, uh, this campaign against pollution, a, a very moving um, video of uh, the, the Native American on the left who uh, would paddle up in a, in a canoe and the, the shoreline was strewn with uh, refuse and uh, there would be a close-up of him and a tear down his cheek. And this uh, Iron Eyes Cody is uh, actually Espera Oscar de Corte, uh, son of, of Italian immigrants with absolutely no native blood at all. And depicted throughout his life, depicted himself as a Native American. Um, Chief uh, John Ross, um, who uh, led the, uh, the, the Cherokee both in the East and when they moved with the Trail of Tears to the West, um, you can see that his appearance is somewhat less uh, pronounced than those that I had just shown you, uh, and mostly because John Ross um, was one-eighth Cherokee from his mother's side. Um, I'm, I'm half from my father's side. John Ross was three times removed from that and led the Cherokee Nation uh, for uh, over 40 years. And uh, he's typically, he's dressed here, and, and just a little aside, uh, he spent more time in Washington lobbying the Senate, lobbying the president against the Removal Act. And in doing so, very often they would come in their own regalia uh, and, and normal, normal native clothing, and immediately they would be given a top hat and tails so they looked presentable when they went to see the Great Father or went to see the Senate. Uh, the top hat that I wear uh, is in... Um, honor of John Ross, because when they would come back home with their top hat and tails, typical of Native American fashion, they would decorate the big Jesus out of the hat. So you'd very often see Native Americans and you'll still see them at powwow. Uh, and that's the reason that they, uh, that you'll see the, the uh, post contact uh, regalia, including a top hat. Um, the story of John Ross being one eighth Cherokee was very important in the blood quantum discussion. Uh, how much Indian are you really? And Indians really didn't care. Here you have the principal chief of the largest tribe uh, in the nation uh, who was one eighth Cherokee and, and spent his entire life uh, for, for Cherokee issues. Ironically, there were 13 waves in the Trail of Tears, and John Ross was the personally led the 13th and last and final wave from 
uh, New Echota, Georgia to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, uh, and where the Cherokee Nation was then formed. Uh, and subsequently, those that remained in the East formed the Eastern Band Cherokee uh, and got a charter in 1868. Uh, a good read, if you, if you have interest in John Ross, a, a good read uh, is Toward the Setting Sun, uh, is, is a biography of, of John Ross. Uh, I think you would enjoy that. And Indians wore buckskins and rode horses. That's obviously a myth. Here we've got Geronimo. Uh, taking a drive in his 1905 Buick. And uh, Geronimo is actually at the wheel with the top hat, uh, the, the uh, native on his left with the uh, headdress is, uh, is someone different. So this is Geronimo here in his 1905 Buick. So horses uh, weren't introduced to North America until uh, the explorers came in the 1500s and uh, immediately the natives adopted the horses as a method by, uh, for transportation, but they were unknown to the natives up until 1519. So talking about the war bonnets that the chiefs wore, uh, myth or fact, and actually it's a myth. The Headdress of eagle feathers worn by many members of a tribe and not just chiefs is dependent upon how and who earned those feathers. The feathers, when you see a, a war bonnet similar to the one that I showed you a minute ago in the Buick, all those feathers are earned one at a time and are awarded the recipient for deeds that are done that benefit the tribe whether it be war or hunting or things that, and, and today even uh, we earn our eagle feathers through acts that help our, our organizations uh, and so forth. So when you see all of those feathers, each one of them are earned one at a time. So here's some different headdresses. This is typical of a plains headdress. And you'll see, um, if, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you all can see me messing around here with my pointer. Yeah. But um, you'll see this, this is an ermine uh, skin. And there's, I think, one on each side. And ermine is a little rodent like a mink but is ferocious and the Native Americans embrace the ermine in very much of their regalia uh, because of his ferocity and each one of those feathers uh, eagle feathers are earned again one at a time and there's some differences other than this is a po monkey from the uh, Virginia area who wears headdress with their feathers straight up is headdress with uh, bison horns uh, eastern headdress uh, most feathers being straight up <clears throat> this is a potlatch headdress uh, just a quick story about potlatch uh, if you don't know what potlatch is it's a great story uh, the chiefs in the northwest coast the Haida Tlingit Kwakule um, would gather goods over years times, whether it be pelts or weavings or things that were of value. And they had a large stockpile of goods and they would have a party and give it all away. And to the people that arrived at the, at the potlatch. Uh, and, and what they would only, only benefit that the chief would get out of that would be every potlatch he would have, they would add a ring right in this area here. And the number of rings that the potlatch had on his hat was the, uh, the benefit of, of having these great parties 
where they gave everything away. Here's an Akahanok uh, from down in the Eastern shore in the Chrisfield area. Uh, the former chief, uh, this is the acting chief. Now the former chief actually had a, a beaver uh, headdress that he wore uh, for decades. So Indians with little or no facial hair, myth or fact. Again, most Native Americans have thin facial hair growth. Uh, something that does need shaving pretty regularly. Um, early on, the natives would pluck their hair and at a certain point, the facial hair would stop growing. Uh, but it's not unusual to see historical photographs of Native Americans with facial hair. Uh, these are Edward Curtis photographs uh, from the 1850s. Nice mustache. Nice bone in the nose, huh? Nineteen thirteen Cherokee. This Cherokee here is not quite nineteen thirteen, but he's a very old Indian. <laughs> and talk about native drumming. Uh, I'm going to drum for you just a little bit here. So find my drum. Most, most people are taught that the Indian, this is the Indian drum beat. And I'm sure all of you have heard that before. I'm sure you were taught that in elementary school when you celebrated Native Americans. If you hear an Indian playing that, that's a phony Indian. The, the Native drumming is a two beat that is akin to the heartbeat, the two different changes in the heartbeat. So <laughs> any drumming would sound like this. And I'll spare you my singing, but <laughs> along, along the way, uh, the, the drum is uh, sacred. Uh, before we play the drum, as I did earlier today, we bless it with uh, some tobacco. We say a prayer over the drum. And as the dancers are moving around, and you'll see this very often at Pow Wow, as the dancers are moving around, the, <coughs> there will be what's called an honor beat, which requires the dancer to honor the drum. And in, when they do honor the drum, the ladies will raise their fan in the air, the men will raise their dance staff in the air, and you, you'll know the drum beat, uh, the honor beat as this. So it's and during that honor beat, they would raise their part of their regalia to honor the drum. Uh, now our drums, uh, large, played by several people. Uh, it's interesting, and, and we, we all have come a long ways in that women were not allowed to stand at the drum let alone sing or drum, and that has changed radically. We now see women not only drumming, but singing, and it's added a, a real rich uh, addition to drumming and the powwow. So here's another one for you. Indian industrial schools were developed to help natives gain marketable skills. I think you know the answer to this one. That's a myth. The Indian industrial schools were the final solution to the ongoing Indian problem. So 1870, 1880, uh, Henry Pratt was a captain in the cavalry and was assigned uh, to Fort Marion, which is in uh, St. Augustine, Florida. 
and any, any of you who have been down there, it's still there. It's actually right on the, right on the water nation, uh, right ad adjacent to the Bridge of Lions. And he had a renegade crew of uh, Geronimo's Indians and warriors and didn't know what to do with them. So what he did besides dress them up in military uniforms and march them around, he had been to the, um, been, he had, he had seen the Hampton School, the Hampton uh, School for uh, freed slaves and seen how successful they were in educating freed slaves. So he set about putting together an Indian industrial school with the sole purpose of educating the Indian out of the men. And so both men and women were put together and Carlisle, Pennsylvania is the first of the government Indian industrial schools. Uh, and it's, it's still there today, actually. It's the Army War College. Uh, there's a cemetery there. A thousand Indian children died while they were there. And it was uh, quite in fact, uh, this is a photograph that I own of a class of about a thousand Indians. You see this young fellow right here. It just breaks my heart to see him. Uh, and up here on the top, these, these buildings, by the way, are still there uh, and accessible when you, when you visit the fort. Uh, Henry Pratt is standing on the balcony here and his horse is displayed over here on the right. I've looked at this photograph through a microscope or through a magnifying glass and of a thousand kids, there's not a smile on any one of them. They would have been brought together from all over the country. This is not a regional school. They intentionally brought native kids from all over the country because they were not allowed to speak their language, wear their regalia, practice any of their culture. And with fewer people of the same tribe, it was less likely that they would commiserate with one another. Uh, this was so successful. This the first one, was, this was so successful that, that the, uh, the government put in effect 25 other ones. Uh, not to mention the hundreds, if not thousands of missionary schools put on by the different religions trying to get the natives to become Christian. Um, if they were not Christian, they were less than human. And uh, the fact that natives worshiped uh, many gods, uh, whether it be the sun, the wind, and it was just akin to Christian belief. So the Carlisle School, they, would, they were there for as long as five years. They were indoctrinated and then when they were sent home, in fact, were sent home uh, as missionaries for the cause and trying to convert the, uh, their families. Um, that, uh, like say a thousand children died here. And uh, one of the things that goes unanswered is the fact that many of these children, when they reached a level of illness that was beyond the ability of the infirmary to care for them, they were oftentimes at that point sent home. So they're sent home with smallpox, tuberculosis, measles, mumps, chicken pox to their clans with little or no immunity to any of those diseases. So the impact of sending these children home really has not been accounted for. This is uh, Tom Torlino on Navajo, and they would take pictures of him before and after. This is, I believe, 1800 and 1803. So he shows up with all of his regalia, his long hair, his, his uh, artifacts that would be religious and put in a coat and tie, even, even lose, loses his complexion to a degree. And they took these photographs to show just how successful they were in changing them. And William Henry Pratt's mantra was kill the Indian and save the man.
Uh oh. <laughs> That's a lot of slides. Are you asleep yet? <laughs> So to add insult to injury, they had them dress up as pilgrims during pageants. And if that wasn't bad enough, they actually had them dressed up as Spanish conquistadors. Um, I do want to make a comment about uh, the recent discoveries in Canada of thousands of mass graves of Native children who actually were in the system, the Canadian system of in industrial schools. Uh, and I had always respected the Canadians in that they called their indigenous people First Nation out of respect. And to find out that they in fact uh, had the same issues with Native Americans and had thousands of children die in their uh, Indian industrial school system. So the Indians live on reservations. And well, the fact of the matter is only 20% of natives live in on reservations and Maryland has no reservations. Uh, there are no native tribes of the uh, recognized tribes that actually have enough land that they could have a reservation. So here's the, here's the good news. We're still here. Um, I'm anxiously waiting the 2020 census to come out as to find out how many Native Americans reside in Maryland, 128,650. 20, 2010 had 58,600. And 2000 had just over 39,000. And the increase, 53% increase across the nation with 9.7 million. Uh, so what do you think caused the increase? I'm not sure I have an answer. I was anxious to see the impact that uh, DNA testing would have on folks recognizing that they have native blood. Uh, there's a whole lot of controversy over the uh, efficacy uh, and reliability of, of the native blood, but uh, it's a good thought to, to go home with, why do you think we have that huge increase in natives in the state of Maryland? And, and we're actually uh, mostly urban Indians. Um, Paul Chot Smith is an author and a uh, Pretty good read if you get a chance to see any of his material. He is a curator at the National Museum of the American Indian. And in his one of his essays, he makes a point that I use in a lecture, and I've actually discussed it with, uh, with Paul Smith on several occasions. His comment was, if you're an urban Indian, you're screwed. Um, the fact that we're, we're, they expect us to be on painted ponies, on reservations and plains, and long hair and so forth. That's not the case. So with that, I'll say wado, thank you in the Salaji language. And uh, I'll take what questions you have uh, and uh, comment. Earth to anybody. <laughs> um, may I ask a question? Please do. Um, I'm just wondering how did, uh, and I know this is uh, kind of a broad question, but how did uh, indigenous peoples usually try to preserve a culture given so much adversity that they faced, especially given how the government was so persistent in trying to suppress it? 
and, and anything that they, the government found to be of significance to the native, they outlawed it. They, they, they wrote laws against the Sundance. And uh, it's, uh, it was done quietly, secretly, and, and there was not much, there was not much interaction between the settlers and the natives, uh, even in peaceful times. Uh, the natives were allowed to come into town on, um, in small towns in many cases, <clears throat> just once a week. And they reserved that, that day, uh, they reserved Monday for the, for the natives to come to town to buy goods and to trade. And, and uh, so there was what was thought to be a native greeting of uh, Washte. And, and most settlers would reply back to Washte that it was hello. In fact, it was the natives coming into town on Monday, which was Wash Day. And, it's, and they're saying, I'm allowed to be here because it's laundry day for you folks. So uh, they, they did it in quiet. And, and today we try to preserve it through education. We do it through powwow. We do it through... Uh, our culture classes at the Baltimore American Indian Center, and and most of us have recovered our heritage, as opposed to having it passed on from our families, uh, and so forth. So, not growing up in an Indian household because of my adoption, uh, I, I had to recreate most of uh, what I do know about uh, my culture. But that's a great question. Any, anything else? Well, I may kick them. <laughs> I think Kwame stepped out for a second, actually. <laughs> um, what's your opinion on Operation Lady Justice? Say it again. What's your opinion on Operation Lady Justice? So like, um, I don't know if you know the, the response to MMIW. Well, I, you know, I think, I, I think it's important to, uh, for, for a lot of reasons. I think that uh, there's so much historical trauma that needs to be dealt with not only with Native Americans, with African Americans, um, you know, with uh, Chinese, Japanese Americans, and so forth, uh, from atrocities that, that people have, have uh, perpetrated on them over the years. And, and you know, I, I wonder sometimes, I, I had a great life. I mean, it's not over yet, I hope. Uh, but, I, you know, I was able to go to school. Education really saved me from... from uh, probably jail, I'm not sure. But in any case, uh, I think that uh, I wonder sometimes why I continue to be angry uh, about the treatment of Native Americans, not me personally, although I, I have seen a great deal of uh, prejudicial and racial uh, things as, as I was growing up, especially in Michigan. We had a small group of Natives that that hung together and kind of kept to ourselves, but it was, uh, you know, it was always something snide or smart or, you know, you know, people to this day call me chief thinking that that's uh, a good thing. And in fact, it's not, it's making fun of my heritage. So it's difficult. Uh, so the Jehovah Native Justice thing, uh, I think the whole issue of, uh, of Native uh, Native women being uh, murdered and 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 at incredible rates, you know, has to be dealt with. I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but also, I am. By the way, y'all, I'm still here. I am in my office. You know. oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Carmen. <Bye. laughs> So I am here. <laughs> okay. 
All right, I, told, I, I wanted you to wake them up a little while ago, but they, they came around. They came around? Okay, yeah, stay up, stay up, stay up. <laughs> well, now that you're on the microphone, your turn to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, you! <laughs> well, give a moment and I will come up with a question. And you play. Well, what I was wondering about a question, I know we kind of discussed this a little oh, late. Um, Sorry, your computer's going to start again. <laughs> but I know we discussed this a little bit earlier about like the e-board for ISH here, but this kind of what are your opinions on the word like warrior? And like if yeah. you're someone who's not necessarily indigenous who uses warrior, is that considered like appropriation or you know, I don't know if you could phrase it better than that. Or... No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a well, question that is this. Yeah, and I wasn't quite sure what the answer was, so I was curious what your take on it was. Well, I think warrior, you know, crosses over to to a lot of, but I think when someone hears warrior, they think Native American, and uh, it's uh, you know it's ironic just uh, how how much the Native Americans have embraced the, our military system because they consider themselves warriors, and not, not only the uh, Food talkers from World War II, but you know, to this very day, uh, they're they're uh, very patriotic to the very cavalry that was their downfall. And uh, I've I actually have lectured to the uh, cavalry at Fort Meade, and it, was, uh, it went much better than I'd hoped for. <laughs> so I think that, I think if if the uh, if the warrior you know as a mascot. I think you could do without that. You know, I, I hear people say, "Well, you know, they use bear, they use bears as mascots. You know, what what's next? Are they going to outlaw bears? So they're putting Native Americans in the same category as animals. So they just don't, just don't get it." Do you mind if I add something about um, what you said, Warriors? Not at all. Um, so, like, one thing I will say is that uh, Natives are often associated with the warrior code. So I'm wondering if that's where some of it comes from, but I know, like, my people in specific, warrior code isn't just about warfare and fighting. It, it applies to anyone who um, is serving their people. So it could be, you know, fighting for rights and advocating or being a doctor and healing your people. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, you know, it, it, it certainly works for modern times. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, back uh, in the day, uh, back in the 1800s, especially the early 1800s, uh, the, the, the real respect was garnered by counting coup. Uh, and that means uh, being able to sneak up and steal your enemy's horses right out from under his nose or something, something less violent. And, and there was, uh, you know, Counting Coup was, uh, was one of the greatest uh, exhibitions of, of being a warrior. And, and along with what you're saying, I have a t-shirt that I had made up that says, my life is my Sundance. So how I live today uh, is my best expression of, uh, of potentially that, uh, maybe what you refer to as that warrior code. So Kwame, if you've got it, don't have a question, we're gonna have to sign off here soon. Too um, much in air time. Uh, <laughs> A question. Um, it's regards to so you mentioned the uh, DNA testing piece, and so I recently, well, two years ago, not recently actually, two years ago, I did the DNA testing, and uh, and wrote down, you know, I guess my um, where I'm from, and so what might one appropriate in, in learning more and participating in there in uh, and, and kind of thinking about where they start their heritage. Uh, heritage. Uh, how might one uh, 
appropriately without you know, culturally appropriating, uh, but also engaging in, you know, some of those pieces that is that make. Yeah, if I understand your, your comment, uh, I think that I think there's some issues with the with actually the pool uh, of uh, Native American to, to get as accurate uh, uh, cross section as you would of, of European ancestry. But in any case, uh, I think it's a great idea if, if you to embrace that and find out about that heritage. Somebody's got to know something. It's it's difficult because you know we, we didn't we didn't vote until 1924. We were never in the census, and and so records were difficult. If they, many government records are still available, but uh, when the government gave you something, they kept close track of that. But it's an issue of it's it's nothing wrong with the fact that you have the realization today that you have native blood and are driven to find out about it and to embrace the culture and and to to share that most of us have learned about our cultures very few of us even even of, even of my age raised in a household that carefully nurtured people in culture so uh, if that sparks in you the inquiry, that's a, a good thing. Thank you so much, Dr. Seymour. Are there any more questions out there? Or over there? Missy, did you have something? I missed it. Oh, I don't know why. Oh, okay. You're I think her microphone's not working. Um, I can't really. No. <laughs> Let's try to mute it and unmute it. Let's see if that works. Okay, your email. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions, Gary and then? The crew. Got any questions? I think Vincio has a question. Yeah. Um. So you mentioned like stereotypes about Native Americans. Um. I've heard one common one, and, and like, apologize if this is kind of a loaded one. Like another stereotype I've heard is alcoholism. I'm not sure, like, could you explain like where that stereotype comes from, and like how did it came to be, and like how much. Is it really based in reality or is it just like a lot of stereotypes, a great perversion of reality? Yeah, I, I've got a I've got an antique sign from the 1920s from Tulsa, Oklahoma that says no alcohol served to Indians after dark sundown. Um, so I, it, it's uh, my experience and it's a great question that that I don't have an answer for, but I do find a great deal more alcoholism among Native Americans than the, the cross section of the public, uh, and and not just heavy. I don't drink well myself, but just heavy drinking uh, to the point of alcoholism. Uh, I know many many Natives that are functional alcoholics have have had good careers. One of the one of those things about you never knew he drank until you saw him sober. Uh, so I think it is something there. And I don't know if it's uh, hereditary, if it's, if it's something to do biological, but there's a great deal of uh, alcoholism in the Native community, unfortunately. Actually, um, we have some comments on this. So we did a book club over the summer, and we um, read, what was it? Um, All the Real Indians Died Off and 20 Other Myths About Native Americans. Um, one of the ones that actually Hayden did was about alcoholism, and there are a lot of moving parts to it. I mean, I could probably talk to you for more than an hour about it. Um, I don't know, Hayden, if you want to say anything, put you on the spot. <laughs> you want to say anything? Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think for alcoholism. Basically, um, 
Yeah, I don't know. It definitely is a problem, um, especially back home, like on the reservation and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> but I think one of the common misconceptions um, that we kind of talked about in our group over the summer is that um, there isn't really any hard, or like concrete evidence that supports that um, alcoholism is really um, hereditary or um, what was it that indigenous people are predisposed to alcoholism? There wasn't really any um, concrete evidence to kind of back that up. Um, so yeah, that was kind of uh, one of the bigger misconceptions. Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely um, an issue at home, especially amongst um, youth people. And that ties in a lot to the intergenerational trauma that exists on reservation back home. So um, yeah. That's all I, I, I think the way that I think the life on the reservation is enough to make anybody drink. Um, but but I, I, I do I do see a, a lot of people that just don't socially drink well uh, in the native community. And uh, I'd, I'd like to know more about that. But that's a great point. Uh, yeah, one thing I'd like to say um, is taking like that people have to also consider how damaging that stereotype is. Um, it's one thing, you know, alcoholism is, is one problem, but also that stereotype that has perpetuated some of these racial tensions. My mother, when she was in third grade, um, she went to go play with a friend of hers who was white. And um, the girl's mother through the screen door said, you're not allowed to play with her. All Indians are drunks. And my mom was in third grade. And that's, that's horrifying. I mean, it's, it's very damaging to children, but to the community as well, to have that stereotype thrusted upon us. Yeah. Yeah. That's very sad. Oh, and then the little girl came out and said to my mom, I can't play with you here, but I can play with you at school. So my mom doesn't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's sad. Yeah. Well, Kwame, with that, uh, I'll, I'll bid you a uh, good evening and, 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 and a thank you uh, for being part, allowing me to be part of this. And uh, I hope you'll be able to do it again in the future. And uh, I, I wish the best to, to Johns Hopkins. Uh, the fact that you were the one of the leaders in recognizing Columbus Day as Indigenous Peoples Day, and I have to tell everybody when I when I signed on the first time, I didn't give a thought. It was October 11th or 14th or something. I said, "Sure, I'll be happy to do it." And then I realized it was Columbus Day, and I thought, "That's a gutsy move." So, congratulations <laughs> to Hopkins uh, on on doing that. I'm yeah. proud to be a part of it. Awesome. We are excited to have you, and we look to your partner. Thank you so much. Thank you. And good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you again.